As COVID-19 continues to spread across the state, this week Kentucky saw the number of positive cases grow by 322. Today, the single highest record brings us our total up to 3,779 and the number of deaths up to 200. While not all counties have reports of positive COVID-19 cases, public health officials are certain that the virus is circulating throughout all parts of the state. Along with Governor Bashir, Dr. Stephen Stack, the Commissioner of Public Health, has been at the center of Kentucky's response to this pandemic. I was fortunate to talk with Dr. Stack earlier today to discuss Kentucky's plan for moving forward safely and methodically. Dr. Stack, thank you very much for taking time to be with us today. It's good to be here, Wayne. Thank you. Thanks. Your department and Governor Bashir have developed a list of benchmarks that have to be met before we start to open Kentucky up slowly and methodically. Walk us through, if you will, these benchmarks and tell us how will we know when we hit each one. So the first one, for instance, 14 days where our cases are decreasing. How are you going to follow that? Right. So the goal, I think, here from an epidemiology standpoint is you want to show that that curve that the governor shows like this, mm -hmm. you want to show that you're on the back side of it, meaning that you've already hit your peak and you're seeing uh, the disappearance of the disease or the decrease in the population. So we're going to have to do our best good faith evidence or, or best good faith attempt, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. to try to just look at the data as we have new cases to determine when we feel we're on the back side. And so the 14 day uh, guideline has been something probably the epidemiologists use, and we'll have to work with that as we go forward. Is that an absolute number of cases or a percentage of cases? Right. So I think right now that's a level of precision that is to be determined. And so uh, as we get more testing and we have better information for the population, we'll be able to refine that and probably pick the best data points. Mm -hmm. We want to pick the ones that help us give the best possible chance of keeping Kentucky and safe. So I think it's still an evolution. What about the increased testing capacity and contact tracing? This has got to be a big one for you to get your hands around. This is a, an enormous lift and it's an enormous lift not just for Kentucky but for the entire uh, country. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to have to do and we've done this before our, our team and uh, the Kentucky Department of Public Health and the local health departments are very skilled at this. Uh, we do it for other diseases when infection breaks out in the community you have to identify the person who's infected, identify the people they came in contact with who might be, have become infected, and then have those individuals isolate during the infectious period of the disease. We've done this before. It's not a new concept. The challenge here is we have a disease that can affect the entire population that spreads very easily and for which we don't have any treatments or immunizations right now that are proven effective. So we're going to have to do this at a scale that we've not done before. So we're working with technology providers to try to find solutions. Yeah. We're gonna hire a substantial amount of new people to help with on the telephone contact tracing. And so as we have more information, we'll share that, but we are actively working on that plan now. Many people were concerned when we talked about social distancing. Doesn't this kind of smack of big brother to a large number of our population? Well, this is a challenge. Um, social distancing is hard on all of us. So mm -hmm. I'm sitting in a studio here by myself talking to you remotely. This is not the way we would normally do this. Um, we are going to have to adjust to a new normal. But as I said already in the pri previous question, this is a disease for which we do not have a vaccine and for mm -hmm. which we do not have an effective therapy specifically for it. The only way to keep ourselves safe and to try to minimize the human harm caused by it is to work to minimize the spread. And we have to do that by keeping a six to 10 foot distance between ourselves. You're gonna notice in the future, we're gonna all be wearing out in public at least, more of those uh, cloth face coverings or other coverings. And when we go back to our new normal, it's not gonna be the normal we knew in January this year. It's gonna be the new normal we know in May and June and beyond this year. And I don't really see it as um, an intrusion on people. I see it as us recommending those things we all need to do to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe. Sure. Which gets into the issue about protective uh, gear. Is there a magic number you're looking for to say, okay, we have enough that we can now roll things out? Or again, is this a percentage of how much population we can cover? So I think what we're going to have to rely on is uh, when the hospitals and the healthcare settings start to open up, that they have on hand and enough, enough PPE to cover their needs for a period of time. So mm -hmm. some settings, a one-week supply may be enough. 
in an acute care hospital, it's probably more like a two-week supply or perhaps more depending on the circumstance. So I don't think it's going to be possible to give some, we need X number of gloves or X number of masks for the state. I think it's going to have to be, everyone has to be able to get their own PPE mm -hmm. by normal purchasing methods like a hospital or a doctor's office typically would do so or a dentist's office. They have to get it the way they normally would get it and have enough on hand to cover their operations for a period of time. I think that's a more realistic way to look at it because then each individual site of care will be the ones who are helping to determine if they've met that benchmark. When you speak about uh, protecting at-risk populations, what populations and how are you going to do that? Right, so the first is the current at-risk populations are most at-risk is uh, those over 60, CDC uses over 65, but mm -hmm. I would say those over 60 and people with major chronic medical problems or weakened immune systems, those individuals are going to have to isolate themselves from the rest of the community for an extended period of time because their risk still remains when people start to uh, engage in society more. But then over time, I really do hope those antibody tests will get to a better place so we can find out people who have been infected and hopefully people who have immunity. If we're fortunate, people who have recovered will have some immunity. And then we may have to start doing much more sophisticated things, trying to um, advise people when and where they can and can't work safely. Uh, and that hopefully will make it possible to, um, over time, relax some additional guidelines. But we're looking months down the road in that. That's not May and June. Okay. When the CDC talks about social distancing at large gatherings, as you know, we have this little horse race here in Kentucky, and that's been postponed a little bit. But realistically, what are we talking about for something like the Kentucky Derby when football games and basketball start up again? Those are going to be a challenge. Uh, it's hard to imagine, as I sit and talk here with you today, returning this year to that kind of normal where we pack yeah. 60,000 people on a sports venue. That being said, maybe the scientists will find a wonderful treatment this summer. Maybe we'll find that the summer really calms the virus down like it does with influenza because of heat and humidity. Mm -hmm. So as much as we would like more certainty, I just don't think the certainty is there. I think people are going to have to get used to we take this one step at a time as information helps guide our decisions for how we keep people safe. So it's possible we may see some events, but the way in which we attend them and the numbers are just going to be way different from what we see right now? I think in 2020 they are going to be different. I think that's a certain. It's a matter of how different. And, and perhaps there will be events where we, we start to come up with ways that um, athletes and others can provide for their sport maybe without audiences and we watch it remotely by television and other sources so i think a lot of that will be a work in progress but we realize how important it is to get uh, people back to work and to get people back to having their sources of entertainment uh, and we'll work with every industry to try to find ways to do that in a way that appears to be as safe as possible in the coronavirus era you talked a little bit about how in the flu things seem to get better during the summer months. So how, when we speak about being prepared for another surge, exactly what does that look like for us so when the fall and the winter of next year uh, come upon us? Right, so one, the plans we'll put in place as we reopen healthcare and other settings will require folks to be able to have access to personal protective equipment, mm -hmm. probably require temperature and symptom screening before you enter certain settings. So we keep people with likely infection out of certain areas, um, require us to wear cloth face masks when we come together in public, still require us to have social distancing greater than six feet in virtually every setting, which means mm -hmm. waiting rooms won't look the same. Uh, retail spaces won't look the same, restaurants and um, entertainment won't look the same. So we'll have to do all of those things um, and that will help determine what the new normal looks like. It'll also inform how we can return to activities that are so important to us like school, entertainment, um, health care and any number of other venues uh, uh, that we need to be able to open up but they'll have to be opened up differently in order to be done safely. Okay. Where are we, to the best of your knowledge, with vaccinations? Is that something that looks like it may be on the horizon? And do you see that? And is that one of the key benchmarks we got to have? So it says on the slide that the governor showed treatments and vaccinations. There won't be a vaccine until 2021 at the soonest. So 
Nobody should have hope that 2020 will bring a vaccine. The science and technology development just takes too long for that to happen this calendar year. Treatments, on the other hand, uh, who knows? We could have a breakthrough in treatment. It could be that they find a drug or some other intervention that really works much better, or we learn about the disease more so we can tailor the treatments we have to be much more effective. So I think the, the hope is that treatments get better this year, but the vaccine won't be till next year. You know, Steve, we had, before you and the governor made your announcements about opening up a few things here in Kentucky, Tennessee and Indiana made the announcement they're going to start having some more business and they're opening up health things. We've done such a really good job of improving things here in Kentucky, which I think by any measure you could say the same things weren't done in Tennessee and to a lesser degree even in Indiana. What impact does that have on you when you're trying to plan on the health of Kentucky when your neighboring states aren't being as uh, strenuous as you are? It's an incredible challenge. So remember, the disease doesn't know borders. It doesn't know a county line or a state line. It clearly doesn't even know a national border, right? Because it started on the other side of the world and came here within a month or two. So it is a real challenge when we're not on the same page and we're not consistent. Mm -hmm. But that's the reality of life. That's the way it is. So the best we can do here is I continue to work with Governor Bashir, and Governor Bashir continues to take those steps and to recommend those things that he believes increase and make most possible for all Kentuckians to stay healthy and well. And we're going to keep working with Kentuckians to get through that. I'll tell you, though, um, we are at real risk in the United States and in other states for having a huge second wave of this disease. And all of the sacrifice we've made now mm -hmm. to prevent that first wave in Kentucky could be undone. So I need all Kentuckians to hear we have got to stay in this together. We will get through it, like the governor says, but we will get through it together. And there's a lot of work that remains ahead. So please stay tuned so we can continue this journey and keep everyone healthy and well. Well, Dr. Stack, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us here in Kentucky for the great work you and your team are doing for trying to keep us safe. And thank you for taking time out to talk with us today. It's a privilege. Thank you, Wayne.